Thank you very much. Um, um, it's a great privilege to come here and present the work of uh, such a large team that was involved with uh, separating these uh, two twins conjoined at the head. So, just before we start to talk about how we went about this and the innovations involved in uh, successfully them, something about conjoined twins. They've been in the medical literature really from almost the beginning of medical literature um, and it is an incredibly rare condition. Conjoined twins, 10 to 20 in every million births and interestingly 70% of them are female. Obviously they are I, uh, ident they're always identical twins and they're always of the same sex. It's not good for you to be conjoined, and uh, historically 40% of conjoined twins are stillborn, and an additional third die from uh, uh, difficulties within the first 24 hours of life. So the twins that we separated were joined at the head. That's craniopagus, and that's perhaps one of the most rare types of, uh, of coin conjoinedness. And so around the world, there's relatively little experience uh, in a serial way of how to deal with these problems. They happen about one in 2.5 million births and so you know, in the West we probably get to hear of about one new birth a year and they represent two to six percent of conjoined twins. Um, one step forward with dealing with difficult problems like this of course is to classify them and uh, there is an O'Connell classification which divides craniopagus into a partial craniopagus where essentially perhaps just the skin and bone are, um, are joined but the uh, coverings of the brain, the brain itself, are not joined and so they tend to represent relatively straightforward problems. Total craniopagus however is a condition where uh, the cranial cavities are joined and the brains may be joined as well but they sit within a single cranial cavity and usually s uh, share some elements of uh, blood supply. At Great Ormond Street Hospital, we've actually separated two uh, types of uh, twins joined in this way, but I'm going to concentrate on our most recent uh, 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 case, which is Rital and Ritaj, who are two Sudanese uh, uh, children uh, uh, born by caesarean section. Both of their uh, parents were doctors, and uh, uh, fortunately they got off to a very good start in life indeed, and we got to he hear through them from a, tra a surgeon travelling in Sudan who was from Great Ormond Street. So what about Rital and Ritaj then? So according to the uh, O'Connell classification, they're a total craniopagus set and they're, a vertex, they're joined vertically, so they're a vertex pair, and they are type 3, which means that uh, they are joined in such a way that their heads are twisted through roughly 90 degrees, uh, which creates uh, uh, challenges for the way the blood vessels are joined and the way that we would come to think about uh, separating them. So what do we know about uh, type 3 uh, craniopagus twins? Generally, with this condition, the brains are, uh, are separate. So uh, with the past, uh, from past knowledge, we know that it's uncommon to have uh, completely fused uh, brains, and therefore that makes them a possibility for separation. There are a number of problems, and they do, uh, they do share uh, problems. And within the skull cavity itself, the brain is covered by um, a layer, a, a covering, thick covering layer, uh, the dura, which uh, um, uh, contains the CSF and has a number of layers to it. And on these MRI scans here, you can see the dura running across uh, uh, between the two brains, showing separation. Its problem, though, is that it is only a single layer. So when we come to separate the twins, one twin is going to need some form of new dura. The other problem with type 3 craniopagus twins is their blood supply. Generally, they have a separate um, arterial supply, so the inflow is normal, but the venous drainage, much of which runs across the surface of the brain and within the dura itself, tends to be shared. And... Uh, this uh, actually is not uh, Rital and Ritaj, but it shows very well um, that uh, th these venous sinuses which drain blood away from the brain sit within the dura 
and uh, are shared by the two twins. And that's often what causes the, the big problem with separating these twins. When you come to separate them, the blood can flow in okay, but it can't flow out uh, if, you, if you share those blood vessels inappropriately. Um, okay, so what do we know about Rital and Ritaj when they came to them? They were total type 3 craniopagus, joined by skull and scalp, single cranial cavity, separate brain, brains, and their blood supply was uh, partially shared. So in order to uh, think about how we're going to separate these, we first need to investigate the problem. And, and first of all, we need to look at them from a general paediatric point of view. There are lots of physiological problems with being joined at the head. Often there are uh, neurodevelopmental problems, there may be neurological problems. And the fact that your blood supply is, uh, is shared in a rather complex way can often lead to cardiac and renal, renal problems because the whole business of circulating blood around the two twins uh, is rather uh, unusual. Um, so how are we going to investigate this? We're going to look at the general health of the twins, and then, of course, we need to do, undertake some imaging so that we can work out exactly what's going on and plan our separation. So those imaging modalities that uh, we need to undertake are, first of all, CT, computed tomography, uh, for looking at uh, particularly bony morphology. MRI is very effective at looking at soft tissues and the brain and the, and, uh, the pattern of the dura is best shown by that. And then perhaps most importantly for planning our surgical separation, angiography. So this is a technique where um, uh, dyes are injected into the bloodstream and we are able to follow how blood flows into and out of the brain. And uh, we use two types of angiography, CT angiography and digital subtraction angiography. And when it comes to planning surgery, uh, medical modelling is, uh, I think, absolutely essential to do this in a good way. So what do we find with, uh, with Rital and Ritage? If we look at um, the CT data here, this gives us uh, accurate 3D information about surface data and this is just windowed so that it, it effectively we can see the outside but we all have information about how the surface relates to itself in a three-dimensional way. And of course um, this is most important for us for looking at the bony morphology and you can see here from these, these three-dimensional images uh, show the shapes of the bone and how they're joined. And, of course, the skull itself is made up of a number of separate plates of bone that are, are joined uh, together. And it's very, these are by sutures, which are here. And it's very important in early life to have these sutures because the brain's growing relatively rapidly and, br and skull growth occurs at the sutures. And of course, conjoined twins like this have rather abnormal sutures uh, because the sutures that go over the top of the head form a ring around the join, which... Uh, uh, creates problems and challenges. It right, would be rather nice to separate them from a bony point of view from that suture, but these um, scans here give uh, a, an indication of some of the three-dimensional problems that uh, arise, because this little groove running across here is actually how the, two, the join between the two brains are aligned. So the skull and the brains are not uh, uh, joined in the same kind of way, and that is going to create problems uh, from a three-dimensional planning point of view when we come to finally separate them. If we look at the uh, MRI scan of Rital and Ritaj, we can see the pattern that we were expecting to see. The brains are clearly separate, uh, although there is, are small areas where they are abutting. And uh, what that tells us is that although there is a single dural membrane between the two uh, brains, there are areas where it's completely absent, and we're going to have to about think about reconstructing that dural layer uh, when we come to undertake the separation. So we're beginning now with these relatively simple forms of imaging to build up uh, a three-dimensional <coughs> pattern of the problems that are likely to face us when we uh, think about the mechanical issues of separation. These um, uh, uh, scans are uh, CT uh, angiograms. So they're, uh, these are CT scans taken after the injection of radio-opaque dye into the vascular system. 
and they're very good for giving us three-dimensional information about how the arteries relate to one another and how the venous sinuses that drain blood away from the brain relate to one another. Um, and on these uh, scans here, we can, we can, we're beginning to see some of the issues about the problems of, uh, of this venous drainage. Because although um, blood has been injected just into one twin, uh, Rittage at the bottom, you can see that the blood is flowing into Rittage's brain, but when it comes to flow out, it flows both ways. So it's the venous drainage is draining away to both twins, uh, and that's how their blood supply is shared. We need to know uh, a lot more detail about how, the, how blood drains away from the brain and how, um, how blood is supplied to the brain. And so a technique called digital subtra subtraction angiography is used. Now, essentially, these scans are uh, undertaken. There are rapid film sequences that show things in real time. Uh, and uh, um, because the radiopaque dye injected into the blood vessels shows up on the X-ray, the, the X-rays look uh, uh, the blood vessels look black. You can't see the images of the skull here because uh, the digital subtraction part of it is subtracting uh, away the bones. So this gives us just a very, very clear view of uh, the details of how blood flows into and out, of the, uh, and out of the brain. And there are a number of phases. There's an arterial phase where blood is flowing into the brain through the arteries. And then there is a capillary phase. This is where the blood is flowing through the tiny vessels in the, uh, in the brain and actually perfusing the brain itself. Um, here, we can see that there is a, an area of, uh, of uh, slightly less dense uh, 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 dying of the, the blood vessels. And this is because, as it turned out, part of Rittal's brain was supplied by the arteries of Rittage. This is going to be a potential problem for us when we come to separation. So, of course, if you, deply, if you deprive a part of the brain of its blood supply, then that piece of brain won't survive, and uh, there, are, there is the po possibility that a stroke will occur. So let's put all that together then. This is DSA and CT data rendered by, uh, uh, to, to show us uh, the, at the outside. And we can see here the, uh, the, the angiographic data. And you can see the phases here of blood flowing in, capillary phase, and then flowing away. And the thing that you can see here is that although blood comes in from just one twin with these injections, it's flowing out both ways. Um, and um, by combining the three-dimensional data with the digital subtraction angiography, we get a very, very clear view of uh, of what is flowing where, which part of brain is, uh, is uh, supplied by uh, which, uh, which vessel. And in fact, one of the twins, it's not shown very clearly on here, had a, an absent uh, internal carotid artery on one side, uh, which again created cha uh, challenges for how we were going to think about separating them. So using these multimodal uh, imaging techniques, we're beginning to build up a very detailed picture of what, that pro of what uh, is happening. So just to uh, share with you exactly what's going on, the schematic diagrams, I think, are very uh, helpful indeed. So these schematics show uh, two separate people sitting next to, uh, uh, lying next to one another. Uh, and on the, the uh, diagrams, there is the heart. The red here is the arteries taking blood to the brain. So these are the little arteries. This sump here is, the meant, is meant to represent the brain itself. And when the blood drains away from the brain, it drains uh, through two venous systems. A superficial system, which is the veins covering the surface of the brain, and a deep venous system, which uh, drains blood away from the very deep part of the vein. And they join up at the back of the skull and go back to the heart. So you have these circulations. So this diagram here represents two people lying next to one another. So what's happening with uh, Rital and Rittage? The, now, they are much more complicated in that they, uh, uh, they are sharing particularly venous drainage. So we can represent on this uh, scan here the fact that part of Rital's brain is supplied by Rittage's arteries. You can see up here. And when we look at all of that data that we picked up about uh, um, the uh, blood supply, we can see that the superficial system of uh, Rital and Rittage is absolutely shared. 
Now, when we come to undertake a separation, it is not going to be possible to share that between them. That superficial system has to go one way. The veins are situated within the dura, and you can't split the dura, so they go one way. Now, things were complicated uh, in this particular case by the fact that Rital's deep system drains into her superficial system before draining away. So when we come to share things out, unless we give the entire superficial system to Rital, which is on the right there, she will have no venous drainage to her brain, and therefore that will cause a venous infarction and she will die. Fortunately, though, we can see that Rital has an entirely separate deep system. And so we have to find a way of encouraging all of Ritter, if we're going to separate them, all of the blood going into Ritter's superficial system to somehow drain into the deep system and out, and then we can separate the two twins and give the superficial system entirely to Ritter. So, uh, and I, that's just showing what we've got to do, um, but we've got to take things just one way. So now we have a little roadmap of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Um, we need to put that 3D data into our surgical plan, and to do that we've used a, quite a, a lot of surgical modelling. Um, when we've got 3D CT data, you can get dig digital printers that will print out 3D models, and although they don't actually give you any more information, being able to handle them, draw on them, helps you with your surgical plan. So this is, these are surface models. And then the most difficult thing we had was those very complex system of veins here. And so we've printed a model that's shown all of the, uh, the veins within the head. And we were able to sit down and say, well, what if we cut here? And uh, would that work? And how are we going to get to that bit? And so forth. So this kind of modeling is really extremely useful in planning your surgical roadmap. So that's what's happened, uh, and we've described things. What were the, what were the implications for Rital and Ritage? And there were a number of, uh, of medical uh, problems arising from this rather unusual circulation. We remember that Ritage was receiving nearly all of the venous drainage for the two twins, which meant that her circulation was working very hard. She had a much higher blood pressure than uh, her, her twin Rital. Her cardiac output was much higher, there was a strain on the heart, and there were signs that she was uh, developing uh, heart failure when she came to us. And actually, if you look at the, uh, the two twins, this is uh, uh, Ritage here. She's a little bit thinner and smaller than her twin. She's doing all of the work for both twins, and she was underweight. Her kidneys were working hard as well, because she was, uh, they were essentially working for both twins. And of course, the, um, the, the kidneys are very important in controlling blood pressure, and so she was excreting a lot of urine to try and get her blood pressure down, whereas Rital was kind of having a free ride of it, uh, relatively little blo blood flowing through. She tended to have low blood pressure, and so her auto-regulatory systems were trying to put the blood pressure uh, up. And so the physiology of these two twins was rather different and uh, conflicting with one another. So one of our first uh, issues was to try and treat these problems, but of course we generally treat those things with uh, medication, with diuretics and, and drugs to control blood pressure. But of course if you give antihypertensive drugs to Ritage, the blood supply is, uh, is shared and you drop the blood pressure of both of them, and Ritage, of course, needed, did not need to have her blood pressure dropped at all. And so the medical issues of controlling their blood pressure were, um, were, were very difficult indeed. And actually, in the end, we ended up by tipping them. So he said, OK, Rital needs to have more blood. And so we elevated the bed so that Ritage was at the top uh, and the blood was flowing a little bit out of her into Rital. And that was about the only thing that really worked quite well in that initial phase. So very simple solutions uh, that we could perhaps all think of work very well indeed. So, okay, we, now we know quite a lot, and we're coming to the business of, well, how are we going to separate them? Can we separate them? Now, historically, most separations have taken this route, and then there has been one single operation in which they, the twins are separated. But this, um, this approach has led, historically, to a much greater than 50% mortality. So either both twins die or one twin die, and there have been no instances where any twin has survived neurologically completely intact. 
Um, so the problems with it are very prolonged blood uh, operating times, huge amounts of blood loss, you know, 20, 30 blood volumes. If you separate the veins in one go, then there's nowhere for, there's nowhere for, the, for the blood to go from the twin that you've, uh, that you've separated and, uh, and taken those superficial veins from. So what happens is the blood flows in through the arteries, there's nowhere for it to go, the brain gets engorged, more blood can't get in, so the, blood, the brain doesn't get oxygen, and so therefore you get venous infarction strokes within the, br the brain. And the other great difficulty, of course, is that you know, if you're going to separate these twins in one go and essentially make a cut across here, how are you going to fill the hole in the top? And if you don't do that, well then, of course, um, the brain is left exposed. So how can we reduce that risk? Um, and this there was an approach that said, well, we can't do all this in one go. Let's do it in, in, in stages. And it was uh, um, uh, uh, for, um, suggested by two American surgeons, David Stappenberg and Jim Goodridge. And they suggested that we, you should separate the brain in stages, so a little bit of, uh, of venous separation, allow the blood on the, uh, to then divert on the twin who's lost the uh, um, uh, superficial system, go back, separate a little bit more, and gradually the, the blood will divert from the superficial to the deep system. And then do that as a stage, complete it, then think about your reconstruction at a separate stage. And we use a technique called tissue expansion to, to do that. And then finally, uh, separate them uh, when you've, everything is prepared. So you're slicing up the risk uh, into small and much more simple operations. Our dilemma was, though, that uh, um, we wanted, for the sake of the brain, to, to do things slowly, but because Rital and Rittage were deteriorating in their health, then they, we were unable to uh, delay things too much. So we decided on a, a two-stage neurovascular se separation, and uh, the first stage was to in divide just some of those uh, uh, blood vessels, allow blood then to uh, uh, divert to the deep system, and that's demonstrated here by showing the deep system veins are greater, and then go back and separate the rest of it. So very gently stressing the, the brain, hopefully we wouldn't get a venous infarction. And I haven't shown many surgical pictures, but here we are making some incisions, we expose the uh, bone and we can cut a window in it, do a craniotomy. You can see the dura there. Then we can uh, um, open up the dura. Here are some veins and we're, we're separating those, giving the dura just to, to Rital. And then when we finish that stage, we put a plastic membrane silastic in so the brains won't join back together again. Then everything is, we put the bone back on and we need to screw it back in place so the twins don't wobble while they're recovering. Uh, and then they're allowed to recover, and we repeat the process. So uh, you can see from these MRI scans here how we're building an artificial dura. This is the silastic membrane, and at the end of it, blood is only flowing one way. So at this stage, the brains are separate. So what about our reconstructive issues? Well, what do we need to do in our reconstruction? We need to make sure that the brain is, sep is, is protected. The cerebrospinal fluid covering the brain doesn't leak out. There's a barrier to infection, and of course, we would like them to, be, to look right as well. And so we need to reconstruct the dura, the bone, and the skin. And we need a reliable reconstruction. And, all that, and because there is insufficient locally available bone and skin, we need to make more of it. We need to cover the defect with hair-bearing skin, and we need to make sure, if possible, that the scars are in cosmetically favourable areas. And it would be nice if the hair could grow nicely. So we planned this on our model, and we decided on a technique where we would make a sinusoidal incision that went all the way around the head, and that meant we could lift up flaps and expose the bone. We've marked on our craniotomies here, and uh, so everything is worked out so that uh, we can gain access for our neurosurgery, and we can expand these flaps. And the idea was that we would flop this over the top of the head, and that would be our reconstruction at the end. But although there was not quite enough skin at this stage, so once we'd completed our neurovascular separation, we put in tissue expanders, very simple silicone balloons that are inflated with saline over a period of five to six weeks, and they gradually stretch up the skin so that we make more skin. And the great thing about this, the design of this thing, is that when we flap this over here, the grain of the hair flows in the normal way, so it should give a cosmetically very acceptable result. We need to make more bone, and we can make use of the fact that... Uh, the bone of the skull is in essentially three layers, an outer and inner 
hard layer and a spongy layer in the middle. And so you can see here a little osteotoma chisel is used just to separate the two layers of the bone, and that doubles the area of bone. And then by taking the bone off the skull and splitting it, we can make a nice round top to the head, and there's almost enough bone to reconstruct the skull. So that's what we did. Um, we went through that process, and uh, happily, that process of gradually separating the veins of the brain meant that there was nothing in the way of venous uh, infarction, uh, and we'd expanded enough that we could re completely reconstruct their skull. So here, this is Rital and Ritage. A, a few weeks after their operation, they made an excellent recovery just after a, a night or so in ITU after their last operation, and happily, they are neurologically completely normal, and uh, it was a great thrill to see them last week. They're wearing their helmets to try and mould their skulls, and they are really catching up with life. So I think this, this whole procedure has, uh, by slicing things up uh, so that uh, you distribute the risk, the operating in little phases is very straightforward, and I think this is really an approach that we can apply to many complex operations. You know, complex problems tend to be, be made up of lots of very small, much more simple problems. And so when you're dealing with <coughs> very, very complex operations, slice them up into lots of simple little solutions. And by doing that, you'll make things easier for yourself and reduce the risk. <coughs> I've talked all about surgery, um, but I, I mustn't forget the fact that uh, surgery is only a very small part of this. And without the support of anaesthetists, uh, pediatric physicians, nurses, occupational therapists. I can't name all of the people that just absolutely have to be involved in a very dedicated way to make this work. So uh, conclusions then, staged approach reduces the risk of cerebral edema from ins venous insufficiency. It converts one complex operation to a series of straightforward procedures and it's made uh, possible by very sophisticated imagery, a dedicated um, uh, multidisciplinary team, and enough money to do it. And I must mention I th the fabulous efforts of uh, Facing the World, the charity that stumped up all of the money to, uh, to fund this very expensive uh, series of operations. And it's been a great thrill to be involved with this. Thank you very much.